Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to my session about designing a digital channel channel for Service Canada. I just want to um, say a big thank you for, for coming along to this session or watching this video in arrears. Hopefully, it'll give you a bit of an idea of some of the early thinking and design work that we're doing at ESDC in Service Canada, looking at how to build a digital channel. So what I'll be doing is providing these slides afterwards. Please do check them out and give us your feedback. Feel free to get in contact and we would really love an opportunity to test and some of these ideas with you and to collaborate where possible. So let's jump into it. I'm going to be giving just a, a fairly generic talk to some degree because this is pre-recorded, but I'll be uh, participating online and answering questions as we go. So please do post them on Twitter or however you like, and I'll make sure that I'm watching and able to respond on the day. Okay, let's jump into it. So first of all, what I'm going to be talking about today is from the position at Service Canada, where we have established a new program. There's a huge program. If you haven't heard of it yet, you're about to be quite hopefully surprised and, and interested. Basically, ESDC is going through a huge transformation, a huge change. There's a new program that's called the Benefits Delivery Modernization Program. And it is a major, major program, not just to modernize technologies, but also to modernize process, to modernize the organization as a whole. ESDC is effectively investing in itself to not just deliver better services, but to shift paradigms. I sort of like to liken this to shifting from a, like a ship to a, a spaceship because, you know, they're moving from a, a fairly old school model that, you know, has been established for hundreds of years and, and shifting to something that can uh, move beyond the seas and into the skies. Modular components, new architecture, new processes, new operating models, everything. So there's three key goals of the Benefits Delivery Modernization Program, BDM, service excellence, policy agility, and a transformed organization. This level of commitment to change is unusual internationally. It's part of the reason I left what I was doing in Australia to actually come work for the Canadian government. It is such a ambitious target, not just focus on, you know, improving a service here or making a small change here, but to actually service excellence isn't just about a great service. It's, a great, it's about ensuring that you can do it now and tomorrow, having the right sort of continuous improvement in place, the right sort of monitoring and responsiveness to change in place, uh, and the ability to be the sort of organization that delivers according to the needs and values and policy goals that are changing every day and all the time. Uh, the second goal, policy agility, not just being able to um, more rapidly implement policy change, but be able to better model it, better inform it, better understand and have a higher confidence of policy change through understanding quite effectively the impact of change even before it's put in place, let alone being able to then roll out and deliver policy change much faster. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. The world is moving faster than ever before, and it's not going to be slowing down. COVID has really demonstrated three critical things that I think we are all, all distinctly aware of and affected by every day. The first one is it demonstrated the huge uh, gaps and inequities in the systems globally. <clears throat> the second thing is that it sped up our need to respond to that very quickly. So a lot of iterative change. But thirdly, it created a appetite for genuine transformation. People want to address the major issues that we found in COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and iterative change isn't going to cut it. So we really need to shift towards serious transformation, which brings us to the third point of transformed organization, transforming the workforce, the skills, the tools, the processes, the empowerment of staff. These are all uh, parts of uh, a very ambitious uh, target in the benefits delivery modernization program. The key goals of the digital work stream. So there's a few different parts of this program. The digital work stream is one of uh, several work streams and our focus is really on the user experience. It's on, fo it's focused on the client experience or citizen experience um, of Service Canada. And it's also focused on the agent and staff experience uh, of the internal tools. So uh, our goal is to ensure from a client's perspective that uh, clients can complete services, can access bundled and connected services, can get high quality, timely and accurate services. And of course, the client needs are anticipated, taking into account that any form of 
proactive design needs to be done very inclusively, collaboratively, and putting control into the hands of the client so that they can have as much or little proactive service delivery as they want as, as aligned with their personal values. So we need to move away from what we currently have in Service Canada. We currently have a fairly fragmented online experience. Yes, there is a single website for all of government, uh, Canada CA, but the moment you start shifting into service delivery, transactional services, you are bouncing along between different sites, different interfaces, different tools, different looks and feels. There is no in-channel support and, and there is no actual Service Canada digital equivalent for what people experience uh, when they walk into a centre or when they call. There is no Service Canada digital channel right now and we're aiming to fix that. So our goal, our mandate for delivering a fabulous uh, client experience and, and user experience is to deliver a dignified, user-centric, responsive and integrated digital journey, sorry to read off, but that delights, empowers and motivates people to help themselves. So that sounds like a lot of fancy words. So let's have a quick breakdown. I do encourage you to go and check out the details of this um, deck afterwards. Don't feel you have to try to absorb it all in this uh, conversation, but these words are all very important and they're all very purposeful and went through a lot of debate before we finalized this mandate. Dignified is critical and dignified and delight are probably the two that really jump out at you. Dignified is about not just understanding your users, but respecting them. Not just trying to make a good user experience, but making one that is inclusive, that has a minimal unnecessary discomfort, that respects their time, that actually respects their being in control of the service that they're getting from their government, from their public sector. I will hone in again on delights as well. Delight isn't just, not all services with government are going to be delightful. No one wants to, you know, pay for that fine or, you know, or, or craves the, the, the annual delight of, of doing their taxes, but we should aim to make our services as delightful as possible, make them helpful, make them trustworthy, make them easy to use, being hel helpful without being creepy, making sure that in government, we're not just doing the minimum that we need to do for the things for which we are uniquely responsible to deliver, but that we're actually trying every day to provide new value to generate public good and to generate things that are helpful for the people and communities that we serve. All of the other bits you would normally expect out of any sort of service provider, government or non-government both, are user-centric, of course. A responsive to change doesn't just mean responding to what you're doing now, it means putting in place all of the appropriate data functions and responsive functions and analytics that can actually help understand when change has happened and respond to it accordingly. Integrated means integrated from a user's perspective. This is critical. A lot of people say, oh, well, it's integrated from the perspective of my system or my program or my department, but it doesn't really count for much unless it's actually integrated from a user's perspective. And of course, empowering people and motivating them to help themselves where possible. There is a, a big difference between people who would um, love to use uh, digital and uh, just need support to do it. And then there are some people who will never want to use a digital channel. So it's also about how we make sure that when people can and want to help themselves, we provide all of the tools and support to do so. When they want help, when they need help, then we have a omni-channel based approach so that people can get support from the phone or from walking in or from, the, from a different channel of their choice that suits their particular circumstances and situation. So how will we meet this mandate? So we're going to design, deliver, manage, and continuously improve a world-class public sector digital channel. This means we need to actually establish an open, uh, operating model. We need to establish the people capabilities. We need to establish an excellent online user experience of all of our services, which of course isn't just a website. It, it's certainly not just web delivered. It's, you know, there might be lots of different ways to deliver services digitally. And it, it really is about understanding what works for people. We also need to then design a transition strategy from existing channels. BDM is a 10 year program. And right now we are planning for tranche one. We are in definition phase at the moment. Tranche one is when we kick into implementation mode, which starts really only in March or April. So there is um, a lot of uh, thinking and design work that's really happening at the moment, which is where I'm coming to you today to sort of give you a bit of a, a view as to how some of that early thinking and design work has been going. But right now is where we're really starting to shift to what will it take to deliver. So let's talk about a digital channel. 
a hint, it ain't a website. <laughs> we have, are starting to see and have seen for decades the changing face of service delivery. Everyone remembers Clippy. Everyone probably remembers hating Clippy. Um, and those that don't, you really dodged a bullet. But the notion of helpers is actually getting more and more important. The fact is that the world is increasingly complex, exponentially increasingly complex. Trying to actually deal with it is, is increasingly hard at the same time. A help, a lot of people go to third party organizations, to nonprofit organizations. Service delivery in governments is, is undergoing a huge transformation everywhere. Service Canada was the first really globally to pull together and create that face of service for, for the public sector in such an effective way, at least in the people and call center functions. And, and that was been copied around the world. Service New South Wales in Australia took that sort of approach to the next level and really created a omni-channel digital complement to that as well, that we, from which we're drawing a lot of inspiration for Service Canada. But, but, you know, we're starting to see help robots. You know, this is a picture of a robot at an airport and they're starting to uh, understand the use of bots um, and robots as means of helping people navigate complexity. Alexa, Siri, all of these other AI helpers are really starting, they're starting to come into their own and starting to be helpful. I remember hearing actually quite recently, a, I was in a cab actually with a, a taxi driver and it was the weirdest experience because I personally, I find these technologies fascinating and interesting and the opportunities are very, very good, but how much I use them and how much I experiment personally is, you know, bits here or there. But I was in a cab with a, an older cab driver and he was talking about how much he loves Alexa and how, you know, it's, it's really great. And he was, you know, his wife will be sort of yelling out Alexa to give him, to give her recipes. And he was telling me about all the great ways he uses it for service delivery. And then he said, and it was really great. The other day we were just having a conversation and we didn't even realize Alexa was listening. And next thing you know, she was, she was, was serving up, was giving us recommendations about new playlists. You know, that was just wonderful. And I said, D didn't you find it a bit creepy that, you know, Alexa was serving you even when you didn't know or want it and he goes no it's great i think there's a lot to be explored about what people do or don't expect the the range of people's tolerances and expectations is many and varied and again i might just quickly refer uh, refer back to um, the other end of the spectrum there are many people for whom even if government had the perfect service delivery will not want to come to government first because and we found this in new zealand as well because there are complexities in their life, because they have a suspicion of government, because they feel very vulnerable and they want to get help from someone that they can trust. Or maybe they just want to, you know, talk to someone. <laughs> what we have found is that at both ends of the spectrum, the people who want to be really proactively supported and the people who really want to be, uh, sorry, really automated, automated in their support and people who really want more people support many and varied and it, and it's and one single person won't have the same preference across the board generally so uh, it's very important that we always keep that in mind when we're doing service design so to come back to this little story so we get this huge changing face of service delivery so it, it begs the question why why do we keep trying to build websites uh, new sort of service delivery websites why do we keep limiting our paradigm of service delivery to the notion that we build a new site. You can talk to people till you're blue in the face about what's what's possible, but in the back of their mind, they're still usually thinking about a web form as, as the means of service delivery. If you want to deliver a future world which enables many different sorts of technologies, many different sorts of user interfaces, which enables personal helpers, which enables apps, which enables anything, basically, one of the hypotheses that we have is that you want to take an approach which has a, and this isn't just a hypothesis, this is proven out around the world, get common service delivery components, common components of service delivery. So you have consistency in the substance and then have diversity in the delivery. One person might want to use a website. One person might want to use an app because they're remote and they only go into town once a, a, a week and they want to just do their reporting of what they have to do on the app. And then when they go into town once a week, it uploads. One person might want to have a R2D2 style robot following them around the house. One person might want to have a voice only service. You know, rather than building the lowest common denominator of service delivery all the time and then expecting everyone to have a mediocre experience, why don't we actually create services that, that are useful, that, that are specific to the different needs people have? 
I would love to work with people on the, the idea of a voice first service, you know, people rather than doing screen reader over a terrible website or over even a good website, what does a voice first service look like? You could use the same service components, the same service register, the same entitlements engine, the same backend APIs, but actually have a service that um, people with a vision impairment love to use, not to tolerate to use. We have so many opportunities now with technology emerging and uh, evolving as quickly as it is. I, I think it's time that we start to reimagine what great service delivery could look like and then think about the infrastructure that we need to support that. So we are looking at the idea of an omni-channel framework that's based on the, the theory and philosophy, if you like, of government as a platform. We believe this will give us the maximum, the foundation for maximum policy and service agility moving forward. So the idea is you have lots of different users. They might be citizens, they might be clients, they might be businesses, they might be people coming through a trusted third party. There might be other government departments and frankly, they might be machines. We need to more and more to design with the idea that machines are users in our, in our worldview. And if our service design embraces machines as users, we have a better chance of designing services that are machine friendly but also that are proactively monitoring for bad machine activity, your Cambridge Analyticas, your, your bad bots, these kinds of things. Then you have service channel management. So your service channels is are all of the presentation interfaces that people interact with, whether they're clients or agents or staff. And it's every user interface in the, in the technical sense of the word or the strict sense of the word. It might be web apps, chatbots, AIs, voice, any form of interface or way that a person is interacting with our services is our service channel effectively. Then you have an inter integration layer below that so that all of your business functions, your data infrastructure, your reusable service components are available to all of your different service delivery interfaces. Now you're starting to get something which is quite powerful, quite scalable, getting a consistency and continuity of the substance across all of your different channels and across all of your different user experiences, but you're not having any duplication of, and therefore potential for um, misalignment of any, any of your, your fundamental systems. Of course, you've got enablers below that. And the, the tricky part of this diagram, which I think people in this audience and the forward 50 audience would really appreciate is the notion that you have, of course, public APIs as much as possible, but also that policy and program infrastructure leverages the same infrastructure. Rather than having policy modeling off separate to service delivery, it's all part of the same ecosystem. All of the services, when they are implemented, have a codified version of rules, a codified version of the implementation of the, of the business logic of the business application of all of it. So why wouldn't our policy and program infrastructure be talking to the same infrastructure and tools so that we get consistency, so that we can have consistency of modeling, of monitoring, of budgeting, of policy reform, of and, and leveraging real data. And again, of course, people start from the perspective that the moment you mention data, there's this dichotomy that privacy and personalized services is somehow, you know, at the opposite end of the spectrum. You can either have good privacy or you can have good service delivery, and that's it. Modern, you know, technologies available to us around everything from confidentialized computing and, and many other areas around privacy and non-anonymization techniques gives us the ability to have both. We can have better privacy, better protection of personal data and better personalization of services. We can actually get just in time, real time approvals and consents by users at that point in time to, and we can stop copying and pasting data around the system and start saying, do you give me approval? to verify that you're over 18, to verify that you meet the means test, to verify that you uh, are a real person. And, uh, and then suddenly we can stop copying and pasting system uh, data around the system and we can start having <laughs> a more personalized, more tightly controlled and more effective quality of service that people can really, really love. So this idea of this, this fairly simplistic diagram gives you, if you like a framework, the notion that everything is either in your front end so your service channels becomes your presentation layer and all of the support functions and mechanisms around that. And then everything else is then reusable from your back end. So let's jump into the people functions a little bit. So a digital channel is clearly not just technology. It's clearly not just tools. It has to be the people functions to support it. It has to be how we deal with data, how we 
embed innovation into the operating model so that there is continuous improvement, continuous exploration, continuous discovery and continuous delivery in your model. You need to have a team that run digital platforms that actually are doing the and, and running platforms as products. But then you need something that sits above that too, because one of the challenges with product management, even though product management is critical to bring into government, one of the challenges with product management is that if it's not subject to another layer, you actually get a challenge. You, you get Lord of the Flies warring between products for attention and funding and all the rest of it. All products should be subject to a point, to a service. So in our model, we have a digital channel management and support function. Again, very common in digital channels around the world. This function becomes the owner of the user experience, of the client experience. It becomes the owner of the Service Canada digital channel as a product. So that then all of the sub products, all of the tools, all of the functions are always being subject to how does this serve people? How does this improve their experience? How does this weigh against all of the other challenges that we need to prioritize? So a key part of our model is on the right hand side there, the circle of service, which is a mechanism for bringing in continuously user feedback, whether it's agents, whether it's clients, whether it's citizens, whether it's insights coming from data or CX analysis, whether it's opportunities or trends that are coming through the service analytics. The idea of having a single pipeline for the channel gives us then the ability to have single channel backlog management and, and the ability to continuously prioritize what will actually improve the service quality for people. And of course, a lot of this then leads clearly into how will the digital channel and indeed all the channels engage. There is a very strong history and uh, operating model for community engagement with Service Canada. And we're trying to learn from and replicate that in the digital uh, arena. So there's a lot of reimagining going on, but at the same time, drawing on the strengths of, of what Service Canada has built up over many years. Oh, and then on top above all of it, of course, is strategy and oversight. You need to make sure that you have a single digital service standard. The government of Canada has a, a, a pretty good high level principles based digital standard. We have built that out into a more assurable and a specific form, which we'll be sharing quite soon and um, and iterating over the coming year or two, but making sure that we actually apply and have a consistency of a digital service standard is critical so that then all of the digital services that people get through service Canada meet a minimum quality uh, of service and a minimum quality of consistency. So to that end, we're establishing five teams. How do these five teams fit together? Well, I won't go into too much detail now, but at a high level, these five teams, which were shared some months ago now with the uh, Canadian digital government community, but uh, we have a digital channel strategy and oversight team. We have a digital channel management and support team, a client data and personalization team. And then the two teams at the bottom are very closely related. The Digital Futures and Foundations Accelerator, which is very heavily based, uh, rooted in, in service design and um, emerging tech and exploration work. So discovery to alpha work. And then the Digital Platforms and Services team, which will be responsible for the running of the digital platform. So all of that front end presentation layer, infrastructure and service analytics relating to it. Uh, and they were very much related to the beta to live functions for the digital channel. All of them very tightly um, focused on that original mandate that we spoke about to deliver a dignified, user-centric, responsive and integrated digital journey that delights, motivates and empowers. How do they relate together? Well, we started playing with different operating model approaches. I thought I'd share some of these just for fun. The idea of the operating model of a spaceship. Your digital channel management and support team and your digital platforms and services team are effectively the pilots and engineers on the crew. Both of them are on the ship. They are the front line of service delivery. They are the front line um, of the people and the technologies that our users will interface with. Channel strategy, client data, and the accelerator are all effectively the ground crew. There's another operating model of a car, which is kind of a, a silly fun one. So the channel management support team are like the driver, hands on the wheel, responsive, ultimately accountable to everybody. The accelerator, digital futures and foundations, is more like the front passenger. They've got, they don't have the pressure of actually driving. They can think about alternatives. They can check in with the kids in the back. They can uh, keep an eye on other opportunities, a second set of eyes to see oncoming dangers and, and, and areas. The digital channel strategy is more like the dashboard, keeping us on track. The client data is like the car computer, monitoring everything that's coming in, 
warning, personalized information to the driver, feeding into the GPS. And then of course, platforms and services of the engine. If platforms are doing their job, then no one even knows what they're doing because it's so smoothly run, has full confidence and is just operating beautifully. And, and then of course we started playing with different operating models for fun. I'll show you the, I guess the Star Trek equivalent. <laughs> this of course caused a bit of debate and everyone then started raising questions about red shirts. But the idea here is that, that we, we, we've got a few different characters here that you can, you can see on uh, the screen, or I'll add some text into a text version of this to share as well. What we end up with is an operating model, an operating model for service excellence and continuous improvement. You can't really have service excellence without continuous improvement because what's designed perfectly for day one won't scale or be relevant for day two or 200 or 2000 and continuous improvement without a commitment to service excellence ends up with fabulously shiny cogs in a machine that can't operate. So from a user's perspective, they're just interacting with Service Canada. They're doing it online by phone, by walk-in, they're doing it however suits them. And then there are a series of functions, both in the digital channel and non-digital channels, the service delivery hub, who just work together to make sure that that user's experience is seamless, is excellent, is escalated to in-person support uh, if needed. Some, you know, if, is supported to be self-service if appropriate. But all of that front-end service delivery feeds into a channel backlog which then is going into continuous experimentation and um, acceleration to then feed back into real-time service improvements on an ongoing basis. Of course, the whole operating model needs to engage very closely with other functions right across ESDC and frankly, Service Can Government of Canada. And uh, of course, the mechanisms for the strategy, for oversight, for governance, for uh, project and product and, and delivery and management are all managed effectively and seamlessly for that team. We do have a lot of thinking that's gone into some of this and looking at the omni-channel approach um, and how you get an integrated end-to-end -end approach from your service design and analytics on the far left through how, what functions should be omni-channel, what functions are specific to digital or non-digital uh, and all the different ways that a person could inter interact with us. And of course, to ensure that there is cohesive and consistent case management that sits uh, below across and across all of it. I want to take a moment to talk about transformation from a culture perspective. So I've talked a lot about sort of what we're doing. One of the key realizations for us is it's not just about what it's about how, if you can't be seen as an example for how you do things, then you are probably doing it wrong. If you don't have sustainability and consistency and empowerment of your staff, then what, whatever you're doing becomes only as sustainable as the people who happen to be involved at that point in time. So for us, the how we do this and how we enable our staff and how we establish the, the you know, a, a sustainable, kind, calm and effective culture is at the heart of this transformation, particularly in our digital team. So what I'm going to share with you just quickly is the culture statement that we have put together so far. So for us, our principles, behaviors, and values, the pillars of how we work. And for us, our, our culture statement for the digital function is that people are at the center of what we do, kind and courageous, that we're distributed first from anywhere, trying to make it so that not only can clients and citizens and agents get whatever they need from wherever they are, but also so that our own team can work. We are a distributed team that works um, across Canada and indeed across the world. And, and we want to make sure that that is supported and embraced. We want to make sure that good ideas can come from anywhere and everywhere. So everyone in the team is empowered to raise their voice, to raise their ideas, to, to, to bring not just their role and position and expertise, but their experience and their connections and their creativity and their passion to this role. We try to work in the open as much as we can. And that is increasingly more so ESDC is on its own journey. And this is part of that broader transformation program for ESDC and for Service Canada. Working in the open is very natural for some people in the department and um, fairly new for some people. So we are a, a big part of that journey in helping the organization to be able to work more in the open more often. To make sustainable decisions, we don't want to just get the expedient decision, the fastest route, the easiest route. We want to make sure that what we don't create new technical administrative policy or other forms of debt 
we want to ensure that we create inclusive inclusivity in our team across the organization across the government across the community and of course being very early on this journey having that as a key principle means that now as we start to reach out more and start to uh, figure out ways of more sustainably engaging that inclusivity is just at the heart of what we're trying to do we want to embrace the challenge of the change journey understanding that this is hard <laughs> there is a constant a constant source of 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 change of uncertainty and of things that need to be worked through so how do you best do that when you're dealing with different disciplines different organizations different teams well you have to be the kindest calmest people in the room creative and curious and to trust in each other and trust in others is another part of that we are looking at how we're going to measure impact and prioritize service design is key to what we're doing and, and the final thing I want to share is just about life journey mapping. We want to really pose that question. How can you build user-centric services if you don't actually understand the context of the user? Mapping how they interact with a single transaction or a single service or a single department or even a single government or a single anything is missing something, is missing the broader context, is missing opportunities for not just how do we do with you or to you what we need, but rather, how can we help you? How can we help you? Means understanding the context and, and, and needs of the user beyond the specific service we're trying to deliver. So life journey mapping has been really uh, driven around the world. We've seen a lot of it happening in, in New Zealand, in Estonia now, in banks, that it's starting to really take off as a concept. And life journey mapping goes so much further than most journey mapping that uh, most service designers have experienced. What, what I found is this little model helped people understand the value. You start mapping a slice of a journey. You know, you start mapping, okay, what are all the steps you take when you retire or when you have a child or when you adopt or when you, you know, choose major, major life, life journeys and you can start to map key parts of it. Usually what happens is the first step, which is fairly low value, but it's a good start, is to have integrated service. So better navigation, better finding stuff, better directing people, better routing them or referring them. The next step is really around automation and digitization. So streamlining those existing steps. That's usually where you start building reusable service components. The next step and you're getting value going higher and higher is about service integration. If a person um, has to register a baby and then also has to register for reminders about immunization and then also has to register for a, a, a social service number and then also has to register for these other 14 things, at the point where they, the baby is registered, why not say, would you also like this same information to be used for these other registrations and the person could say yes or no being able to actually reduce the steps for people means understanding all of the steps across the journey and then being able to actually integrate them according to the or give the person the choice to integrate them according to their need but after you've mapped all a whole single journey you have the opportunity to then look at the whole thing and start to plan service reform so we saw this in new zealand happen here's the map of the actual mapping of the user journey of having a new child come in your home which necessarily tracks both the birth and adoption journey and to positive and less positive story ends as well because you can't just build a service for the good story you need to even more um, urgently in a lot of cases build a great service for people who are going through tough times so this is some of the mapping that we've done, working and engaging with users, with clients, with agents, and to start to map this out. So it's a good framework to start. And from mapping a user journey, you can start to say, what are the little things we can do to help now? Where are the opportunities to automate certain things, to predict certain things, to be proactive about certain things? What data do we have? What don't we have? How does the journey change for a person um, with a disability or from a remote area? or from different cultures or from an indigenous perspective. It starts to create a framework for real empathy and understanding how to help a person that, that starts to sit above and beyond the usual agendas or, or, or barriers that we have between us. It gives us a framework to work together across departments, across functions, and indeed across sectors to actually help people on their journey. So in our work, we did uh, a mapping of the major pain points by those different slices. We looked at what opportunity statements could be there for that. And please, I encourage you to go back and check some of these. And it led to some future state service concepts for what we could possibly do in future, not right now, but some uh, ideas around what is needed for that journey. This is just looking at the having a child come into your home journey. So we need you. I'm going to finish on this point. We are building, well, we are designing right now a, a new 
digital channel for Service Canada, a new way of getting supported online. Please help us, please contribute, please give your feedback and uh, we look forward to working with many of you um, over the coming uh, years as we continue on this journey. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it and I really look forward to, to being able to see you all in person again sometime soon. Thank you.